Hi, I'm Michael Silverton, co-head of Macquarie Capital. I'm joined today by Matteo Jaramillo, co-founder and CEO of Form Energy, which is pioneering low-cost, multi-day battery storage technology with a vision of enabling a reliable and fully renewable electric grid year-round. Prior to founding Form, Matteo held a number of key roles at Tesla, including leading the energy storage program. And before that, as a member of the founding team, a distributed energy storage firm, Gaia Power Technologies. This experience, along with an AB in economics from Harvard, gives him a unique perspective of both the economic and technological challenges of this industry. Matteo, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Matteo, in, in, in some of the other segments today, we're hearing about the commitments that our clients and partners are making to net zero. Whereas at Form, your goal is to deliver the technologies to help make that ambition a reality. Can you tell us more about Form Energy and its history? Yeah, of course. Uh, Form's now about four and a half years old or so. So around 2017, uh, there, there are five co-founders, I'm, I'm one of them, um, got together and said, well, what kind of energy storage would it take to allow us to have 100% renewable grid? And, and said it a little bit differently, you know, very candidly, what kind of battery allows you to replace a coal plant? That's sort of the simplest way that, that we could think of to put it. And, um, and, and when we did sort of the math on it and we sort of figured out what, what it would take, uh, it implies a battery that's never been commercialized before. It has to be cost effective over hundreds of hours uh, at least. Um, and it's got to be able to scale, at, you know, massive scale. This is, we're talking about a trillion dollar CapEx opportunity to go after. Um, and so, so that's the kind of battery that we started out pursuing. Um, and, and that really is the market that we're going after, you know, that trillion dollar market for all of the thermal generation that's out there. Um, and that's because the renewables are, are so cheap and they're so abundant and so cost effective, um, but they are limited if you cannot address uh, these longer periods of intermittencies. So, uh, so that's what Form set out to do. Um, and the battery, as I mentioned, is, is unlike any that's been commercialized to date, primarily because we're pursuing such low cost uh, that it ends up having to look almost by definition uh, much different from anything else that's out there today. Yeah. And to that point, how important is multi-day storage in helping society move towards a completely renewable grid? Yeah, well, we've, we've come up the curve incredibly quickly, starting out with, you know, 10%, 20%. Now we're in many grids are 50, 60% uh, renewables um, as, a, as a percentage of kilowatt hours. Um, <clears throat> but we're now starting to get into the tricky territories. When you, when you pass that 50% threshold, uh, you do see a lot of curtailment and you do see a lot of uh, congestion. Um, and increasingly what you see is that you still need all of the thermal resources as backup, right? Um, because you can't fully get rid of them. They are displaced in the market many hours, right? Like I said, about half the hours of the year, they're getting displaced, but then there are critical stretches, you know, days, weeks, even, even sort of extended periods where they are stepping in and performing a very uh, important reliability function. We can't just ignore that uh, in the system overall. And, um, and so if you want to be able to replace them and allow the wind, water, and solar to replace those thermal assets, you have to be able to bridge those multiple day gaps that are there. Um, Forum invested very heavily uh, from the very beginning um, in our history in uh, deep analytics. So really deeply understanding you know, what does the math say about exactly how long those durations have to be uh, and what are the trade-offs to get there. Um, and what we found is that uh, the, the main problem that you're solving is not necessarily taking an extra kilowatt hour from summer and moving into winter. That's not, that's not really the challenge. The challenge is running uh, for, the, for the weeks, charging up in the week before the storm, through the storm, discharging, and then recharging afterwards. And usually those, those are covering you know, oh, maybe a week in some parts of the world, maybe that's two weeks. Uh, you know, we're seeing that happen right now in the UK with very low wind. So I say storm, but really it just means intermittent period. Um, and so that's, that's where we started to, to really focus on. And, and that's the role of multi-day storage um, because that's the main function that you're trying to replace in the system. And you can see that through the dispatch profiles of let's say bin barrack gas plants. That's exactly what they're doing in the system. And so uh, uh, cost-effective multi-day storage has to be able to perform exactly that function if we wanna to get to really high penetration of renewables. Great. And so 
In July, Matteo, you uh, you revealed the technology behind the battery, and I know for uh, some years we've been trying to uh, to understand it, and and you finally revealed it to be an iron air battery, um, and uh, we wanted to understand it. You said good luck, but I'll explain it to you as reversible rusting. Yeah. So, can you uh, explain the technology and and why do you think this might succeed where so many other technologies have failed? And what are some of the real obstacles you see to uh, being successful at scale? Yeah, well, that's right. We, we just um, talked publicly for the first time about what that chemistry is. Um, and that wasn't out of you know some desire to just unintentionally be stealthy there. It's really just because we wanted to be sure that, that we had made enough progress where it was meaningful to talk about, right? The, the, the battery industry, which I've been in for a long time, has gone through so many hype cycles and, you know, sort of nauseating to think about another hype cycle with a, with a battery company. Um, and so we, we wanted to be sure that we were on stable ground, that we had made enough technical progress that we could really start talking about, okay, how do we get this in the market as soon as possible? So, so we hit that inflection point. Um, and then of course, talk, talked about it, you know, why iron in the first place? Um, those things that I was talking about at the beginning, you know, very low cost, very high abundance. Well, obviously iron ticks that, uh, both those, those boxes. Um, it, you don't have to squint too hard to see that the earth is basically just a ball of iron, right? The molten iron, the core. Um, and, and as a result, it's a phenomenally crustally abundant uh, uh, material. Um, you know, it's mined uh, in sort of mind boggling scale. And, um, and if we can figure out a way to, to do that, uh, to use it as, uh, as a key input to the battery, well, then you, you have an entitlement um, to go tackle really uh, the, the scale of the market that we're talking about. Again, terawatt scale systems. So, um, so that's why iron in the first place. Now it has to be embodied in a battery. You got to figure out how to actually put it into a battery. Um, and and as, as you said, it's an iron air battery. So all batteries have an anode and a cathode and, and something in between. Um, and so for us, uh, the iron is that anode and the air cathode is, is the, the other side of the battery, the, the positive side of the battery. Um, but really what it is, is it's a membrane that allows oxygen to pass from the air into the liquid electrolyte and then to rust uh, the, the iron there. Um, everybody knows that if you leave iron out, it gets oxidized, right? That's sort of a, a fundamental process of, of, of the earth these days. And, and we've all experienced rust happening in ways that we would prefer that it not happen. Um, and a lot of human sort of mind, uh, mind uh, share has gone to figure out how to deal with corrosion, right? We're, Think about the Iron Age and everything since then. Well, lots of humans have been thinking about this for a long time. Um, the trick is getting it to go the other direction. Uh, how do I put electricity in and get back to that metallic iron? Um, and, but that is exactly what we're doing. And, and one thing that we realized is that, is that we could use a version of iron uh, that's already being produced at massive scale for, uh, for the steel industry today. So we don't have to go make uh, that iron ourselves. Um, another industry makes it for us in, in many ways. Uh, the steel industry is the largest producer of battery anode material in the world. They just happen to use it for steel as opposed to for battery. Uh, but what, what we figured out, one of the major advances was that we could use exactly that thing that they are making and put it into the battery. Um, and so that rust process happens you know, in this liquid, in this electrolyte. And it happens in a way where you don't get that sloughing, uh, sloughing off, right? If you sort of have a piece of metal and it's rusted, you can sort of brush off uh, the rusted part. Um, but, but the design of the anode itself, again, a byproduct of the way that the steel industry prepares this material, um, is that uh, that process can happen without that, that side effect. So it's a, it's a porous material. Um, and, and so th uh, that's, that's really all that it is. It's, it sounds very simple, um, but, but that's how you get to very low cost, right? To, to you know, low tens, ultimately to low ones of dollars per kilowatt hour. That's, that's where you have to be uh, to, to be able to tackle those multiple days of, of cost-effective storage. And, and the key obstacles that you now? Yeah, well, we're not short on obstacles. Uh, that's, that's for sure. <laughs> We've come a long way in, in the four years since we started, but you know, we're not in the market yet. Um, but, but the challenges are fundamentally different today than what we started with. So when we started, there was a lot of questions about does the universe work the way that we hope it does type questions, right? The science questions. And we turned over enough of those cards that, that came up in our favor that we're now to the engineering questions. And we're saying, okay, well, now it's a very, it's, it's a not simple engineering problem, but it is an engineering problem. And with fantastic engineers who solve engineering problems. And so that's really the phase that we're in, uh, designing the product um, and getting it into the market. So, so challenge one is uh, 
finishing really the design of the product. Uh, we're building at relevant scale now today. So in our labs today, we're building meter scale batteries. Imagine a battery the size of a washing machine. That's what we're building today. Um, and that's the repeat unit. So all of the technical performance and risk exists at that level. And we're, we're building and testing at that scale today. Um, and so we need to, to finish that process. At least as important from a challenge perspective is uh, getting everybody on board who will be an off taker of the battery now so that we can linearly scale from from the very first projects that we're putting in the ground, right? Um, in other words, we have to establish bankability of this asset as quickly as possible, right? It's, it's, it's critically important that the people putting the money behind the projects, which I know you know a lot about, <laughs> have a lot of faith in the, in the product itself, right? And, and the, of course, the, the way for doing that, the process of doing it today is very different from even 10 or 15 years ago uh, when, when you know, the, the broader environment was just different, right? Um, you know, the appetite for risk, the need for change, um, these things are, are very different um, from what they were. And so what we look for is very close partnerships to help bring this newer technology in and scale as linearly as possible. From a business perspective, we can't afford to deploy our first pilot project in two years and then sit on our hands and watch it for 10 years, right? That, that simply doesn't work. Um, and I don't think that works for the broader industry either, uh, unfortunately. So so we, we have a very close partnership with off takers to, to make sure that we are scaling you know, commercially as quickly as we possibly can. And uh, if, if you think about uh, the adoption curve and you've got the engineering and now the bankability, I mean, how significant a contribution could this make to fighting climate change and over what sort of time frame? And, and what could it do to the cost of carbon-free energy for consumers? Well, I, 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 you know, I'll be a little bit immodest for a second. I, I think that we can uh, cut off 10 to 15 years of the back end of the decarbonization process. That, that's, that's the impact that I think that, that this kind of technology can have because it can scale, you know, it can hit the relevant scale for the, for the globe, really. Um, that, that's why this is compelling. Um, and so the work that we have to do over the next two to five years, it, pretty much no matter what, there's a path we have to get through. We've got to, we've got to establish it as, bankability, as bankable. We've got to you know, get the right commercial contracts in place. Uh, obviously the technology needs to work and hit the cost points and everything else. Um, but if we're able to get through that, which I, I firmly believe that we can, um, then the impact is that we can bring forward those goals, you know, at the back end, you know, and then what we're talking about is, you know, not a, a scenario that, that is, you know, coming to fruition in 2045 or 2050 for decarbonization, but rather that we're hitting it in 2035, you know, or maybe 2040 or, or even earlier than that. So, um, so that's really how we think about it. Um, and, and that's why we're doing all the work that we're doing today with the partners that we're working with. You know, this is about scale, right? It's about time and scale. And, um, and it requires the efforts across the spectrum, right? Not, not, just, not just the technology companies, you know, doing, going it alone. That, that doesn't really work here. That, that's not the point. Um, uh, we're, we're building broad partnerships across the industry and really across the globe. And, and it sounds like you're optimistic about, at, about the Paris uh, targets. Uh, and incredible if uh, if you can shave ten to fifteen years off that, and and uh, we're clearly a believer. But what else is out there that that excites you? Um, what other technologies that uh, are going to be needed to make that happen? Yeah, I, it would uh, scare me a great deal if we were the only <laughs> uh, reason to be to be optimistic here. Um, so so I see lots of uh, lots of promise uh, across the spectrum. You know, the, this the power industry. It, it likes a diversity of assets. There's no silver bullet out there, right? It, it is really a combination of, uh, a, a, of lots of different kinds of approaches that, that I think will succeed. Um, it's everything from you know, building more transmission, uh, deploying solar and wind at, at, at ever increasing scales uh, in all territories you know, across the globe um, to things like smart policy and, uh, and implementation of, uh, of, of, of newer techniques for managing the grid, being smart about it, right? Efficiency and um, and software controls and everything else. I, I think it takes you know, every tool at our disposal to succeed uh, to hit that Paris goal. goal. Uh, it's not so much that you know form is going to show up and you know on a white horse by any stretch of the imagination. I think we have a, a role to play, a, hopefully an important role to play um, that will lead to, to success for us as well as for broader society. Uh, but there's there's lots of different um, technologies that, that that can and I think will come uh, come to the fore here. Um, uh, so I'm I'm optimistic uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, primarily because there's so many people getting involved uh, in ways that they were not getting involved before. And, that, and I mean that across the board, uh, you know, talented people from other industries who want to work on climate now, 
uh, and just getting that you know that that, that brain power uh, and horsepower is part of it, um, but also the right policies. I think I think a lot of governments um, are now leaning in. I mean, in the United States, of course, uh, we have recently that this proposed bill uh, out of the out of the U.S. federal government, which is you know if they pass it, it will be, it'll be a landmark bill, um, and and I think that's uh, just extending to all basically relevant um, stakeholding governments that are out there, and of course the role that companies have to play as well. Um, you, you know, the, the social license to operate um, in society basically is is that um, there's a response there to, to the climate uh, crisis. And, and we're seeing that across the board. So it, it isn't so much that we have all the technologies in hand today that they're proven, that they're bankable, um, but but that um, but that the movement is there to, to go uh, identify and implement all those solutions. And 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 it'll be a, you know, all of the above approach, I think, that's, that, that leads us to success. So it's... Uh... Really exciting to see things getting real um, for Form Energy and, and your vision coming together. I mean, you've got a really impressive array of investors, uh, whether Bill Gates Breakthrough or Temasek and TPG uh, Rise. So, you know, we're delighted to be involved. But now you have, um, you've announced the contract with um, uh, Minnesota Utility Great River Energy to pilot the technology. And, and you mentioned uh, the partnership with the seller Mittal before. Um, when will we start to see a, an actual project uh, break ground? What, what's the sort of time frame you, you think it, it, it will be before before we can we can see the technology deployed? Yeah, so so you mentioned the project with Great River Energy there in in the U.S. state of Minnesota. Um, that'll be deployed at the end of 2023, so about two years from from when we're talking, and. Uh, and then we have projects in the pipeline for 24 tens of megawatts and then 25, you know, maybe hundreds of megawatt scale uh, and then go from there. Um, so, so I think, I think we'll see a pretty linear path from there. You know, there's a, you know, with the reveal of the chemistry and, and some of the press that we got um, out of the, the Wall Street Journal there and a lot of great follow on press, the, the inbound interest has been uh, frankly overwhelming. And so uh, we don't have any shortage of uh, counterparties that we're talking to right now for for those projects to, to follow the, the one that we've announced in, in 2023. Um, so it, it'll be uh, as quickly as we can possibly do it uh, right after that one. Um, and that'll be focused on the U.S. to start. Of course, we intend for this to be a global market. And so what we're figuring out now as well is not just what does the scale look like, uh, uh, process look like for, for the United States, but also what's it look like in Europe? What's it look like in Australia? What's it look like in Japan? Uh, you know all the all the relevant markets on um, India, in Africa, you name it. Um, again, we intend this to be a global market. So when we think about that scale uh, and we think about the process, we're also thinking about for every market because because we think it's relevant there. Great. Well, Matteo, you've certainly um, raised our ambition, and um, we're we're proud to to be involved uh, with you and form in a, in, in a small way. Uh, and congrats, congratulations on all your success uh, to date, and, and we look forward to, to being supportive going forward. So thanks very much uh, for your time. Thanks, Michael. It's been great to have uh, you and the team participate um, in our path uh, from the very beginning uh, and, and you know, being committed to, uh, to seeing an outlandish vision uh, hopefully come to, come, come to fruition here. So uh, it's been fantastic, and thank you very much. Thank you.